Hello, my name is Jordan Klein, and I am the host of Fireside Paranormal Podcast. If you're into ghosts, UFOs, cryptids, the unknown, then pull up a chair and join me by the fire as we hear real stories from real people. Each episode, I interview paranormal investigators, authors, experts, and legends in their field. Here at Fireside Paranormal Podcast, we have something for everyone. If you're an experienced researcher or if you're just getting into it, we have a spot for you. We're found anywhere you listen to podcasts. So grab your friends, tune in, and remember, don't be afraid, only believe. You ever seen a ghost? Been abducted? Heard your name whispered from the other room when you're all alone? No, you say? Me either. But if you're like me, you're still fascinated by the paranormal. It seems everyone else has had an experience, and you want to believe it all. So why doesn't it happen to us? What does it all mean? How does it work? Is any of it real? Welcome to Paranorm Girl, a show that will attempt to answer these questions by taking the paranormal completely apart in search of proof. I'm not a blind believer, nor a hardened skeptic. I'm just looking for answers and willing to accept what I find. Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. On today's episode, I am joined once again by the ineffable, quintessential, highly congenial Jason Fife. He's on loan from Lost Souls Paranormal Detectives out of Knoxville, and I'm so thrilled he accepted my invite to come back on the show. They just wrapped up a pretty spooky investigation at Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, a very active joint, as you'll hear, and Jason shares some of the evidence they caught and things that took place at that overnight. But we also get into some of his other paranormal experiences and cases, a technique for spirit communication that his team utilizes, and some of his top locations to investigate. I always have a really fun time speaking with Jason, and I am so excited to share it with you. So, please enjoy my conversation with paranormal investigator Jason Fife. A founding member and investigator with Lost Souls Paranormal Detectives, fresh off a brand new investigation he's going to share with us today. Welcome back to the show, paranormal investigator Jason Fife. Hello, everyone, and uh, I really appreciate you having me back on your show. Absolutely. Well, we, we talked about that last time. It was such a fun interview, and I, I knew then I couldn't wait to get you back on. Um, that was, gosh, that was back in February. It's been a minute. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's, it's been a while. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, well, how before we get into everything, how are you? How are things? Doing good. Um, uh, my regular work is good. Um, so that means the paranormal work is, is good too. Kind of, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but it, it's kind of been since summertime's hit, it's kind of been the norm, you know, yard work, just different things like that. But it's just kind of the, the normal summer. Just a normal, regular, whatever yes. summer. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> guess same here had a lot of bouncing around with uh with jobs and doing a big move here pretty quick so but you know same old same old so uh (laughs) listening back over the last time we talked our time went by rather quickly and I know there were some other stories and experiences that you had that we just didn't get to but Lost Souls is fresh off a new investigation, which is something I I definitely want to hear about. You dropped some hints that you guys got some interesting evidence this time through, and I'm so excited to hear all about it. So let's jump right in there. So where did you guys go? Okay, we we, um, went to Old South Pittsburgh Hospital. It's about two, two, two and a half hours from Knoxville, uh, Tennessee. Uh, it's right outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it is uh, the Old South Pittsburgh Hospital in Old South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. A lot of people think it's like in Chattanooga, but it's actually like right outside. Okay. Okay. Have you guys investigated here before? Yes. This makes my third time uh, going. Uh, they actually, the first time I went, um, the previous owner uh basically the place was in shambles 
uh, it was almost like it was abandoned, sort of. But they still ran it for haunted groups. Um, the last time we went, there was a car inside the building. I mean, it was different. I mean, it was um, none of the wings have been really blocked off. Um, so it was kind of like in at your own risk type deal. But this time we went, the new owners uh, of it, they've actually done a lot of work to it. It's very safe uh, now than it, than it was in the past. So you can go there for an overnight investigation or a day tour or anything like that, and it's it's fine. Okay. You know, there's not objects laying everywhere, if that makes sense, where it, where it kind of used to be abandoned. Yeah. Did uh, did I hear you right? Did you say there was a car inside of the building? <laughs> yes. The, the story, basically, it was built um, to be that area's local hospital. And because it was, I think it was like an hour or 45 minute drive to the closest hospital in any direction. So three doctors got together, built this hospital out of their own money. And um, it's very primitive. I mean, it's you know, one place for an ambulance to pull into and it's around back. Um, it had, I think it's, I want to say it's four stories because you have a, uh, the basement, which is where the lunchroom was at. Then you have a uh, first floor, which was kind of like where that nurse, uh, a big nurse's station. Uh, and that's where people would enter and exit to the hospital. Then you had a third floor, and then there's a the, the top floor, and it has a like a garden in between them because it's kind of like a horseshoe set up. It's kind of like a what? A uh, horse, uh, sorry, a horseshoe. Oh, okay. horseshoe set up. Gotcha. Well, it looks kind of like a horseshoe. Um, but this time when we went, the things that happened there, because uh, I I went this time just purely as an observer. Mm-hmm. I just I just wanted to go and you know see people's reaction and see how what people did you know just how it, everybody functioned together because I've investigated with this group of people before and they're phenomenal they were super good friends and like these people are just insanely good at what they do and we got there it was kind of normal everything was was normal with the place um there was like a 30 minute tour where they took you around and this is overnight investigation. So it's, uh, we got there at 6 PM uh, to 4 AM. So we got there, we went in there, met them. They gave us a 30 minute little tour. And basically there are two working lights in the whole building. So you have a lot at the, the ground entrance to go into the hospital. And then you have a lot in the, um, like kitchen area that they have set up for you. Okay. That's the only two lights that are on. No working elevators. It's, yeah. So it's up to you to kind of bring your own equipment and flashlights and whatnot to to be able to get around? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's pitch black in there. Once you walk about 10, 15 foot, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Oh, wow. Which, if you're... Scare of the dark is not a great place to be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll get I'll get to why I said that here in just a minute. Okay. Um, it kind of has a has a thing to it, but um, and we we laugh, but um, uh, even as we we're doing it, it was it was hysterical in a way. And um, so we got got everything set up, and we decided, okay, two of the guys, um, of course, my best friend Craig. He was like, I'm going to go off and because he hadn't been there since they did the remodel and everything. And I had either. Mm-hmm. And so he was like, I'm just going to go off and, and wander and take pictures and check all this stuff out. And we're like, OK. You know, we had walkie talkies just in case. And I brought a friend of mine, Brandon, that I work with. He'd never been on an investigation before. Never any kind of paranormal stuff whatsoever. Everybody else that was with us had. So Brandon's like, he's going that way. He said, I'm going to go by myself this way. He's a little skeptical. You know, he wants to see kind of what this is all about. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we get the rest rest of the stuff set up. We're like, okay, we're going to go in, you know, groups of two or groups of three. So we all split up. And this place is, is big enough to where if you're in the next hallway, you can't necessarily hear the other other people. Okay. So, and in some halls, in some halls or hallways, you can hear other people. So it's it's very weird, the dynamics. And I can see where a lot of people that go there, 
they hear noises or knocks or sounds that aren't actually paranormal. Okay. It's it's just the creaks and crevices of the building. Um, so we went up, got set up, and I didn't really experience anything personally uh, until the end of our time. We all got together, kitchen area, and unbeknownst to me, which I had a feeling this might happen, but I wasn't sure. So two of the ladies that were with us both had – no, I, wouldn't, I don't want to necessarily say fear – but they wanted to test their abilities. So we they asked to be blindfolded, and we led them to the places in the hospital that they wanted to go, blindfolded, as we were recording. So they were a little iffy anyway about doing this, and I don't blame them. Because when that happens, it's like all your senses kick in. Yeah. And, and you're just like, so you've got that plus – your paranormal ability or your spiritual ability, you've got that, and all that combines into you know, what you're trying to do. Right. Trying to walk, trying to focus and stuff. So that was very interesting how that happened. We had some great experiences on that, too. Okay. Um, now, I, I don't mean to interrupt. That So the ladies, oh, they, yes. they were already kind of fearful of this experience, but they, they wanted to be blindfolded on top of that and, and walked around? Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, that that was their, I mean, we sat down and talked and stuff about it before we did it because it's, it's always safety first. You know, you want to make sure, you know, nothing was going to happen to us. But spirit, spiritually, you know, that you're really going into, you're crossing a fine line. Because mm-hmm. you're almost walking into to the spiritual realm when you do that. Because you're at a known haunted location. You're have abilities to possibly hear see stuff like that spirits talk to them but you're testing yourself because you know you have certain gifts but you want to push the envelope just a little bit further okay okay to see what what happens yeah that makes sense i have to say that did not disappoint because both of the ladies that were with us were i mean we didn't even have flashlights as we were walking them we had someone behind us with a flashlight. Mm-hmm. So he would, he would shine the flashlight kind of like down at the floor so it would make just enough light for us to go down the hall or wherever they wanted to go. So not only for me, I could already see. So I knew kind of what was going on. But to hear them tell me that, like word for word as we're walking, someone just darted out of this room. Yo, so I just saw someone sitting over here in this room. Ooh. It was it was it was it was really, but it was really cool to see that they're developing the gifts that they have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What um what kind of evidence were you guys able to collect over the night? We at the that probably I want to say it was probably around two thirty, uh, or three o'clock, like the witching hour. Um, we all went into a room. And it was called the Candyman's Room. Um, after the hospital itself um, closed, a couple of the wings had stayed open for like a drug rehabilitation um, and stuff like that. And then on one side, and then on the other side, they had kind of like a mental uh, ward, uh, like on um, one side of the, the hall. So it was kind of split. Okay. The the room that, that we went went into that we were all getting the most activity was the candy man's room. Now why and what is the candy man's room? He legend has it that he was uh, in the uh, drug rehab uh, or the the sobriety and he could never get clean. He had nowhere else to go, no family, nothing like that. So he would not come out of his room unless one of his friends or somebody he knew or a possible drug dealer would bring him his candy. So that's why they called him the candy man, because he would still get his fix. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's kind of one of the little the little legends. Um, but we went in there. We were in there probably 15 minutes, and it got, it got a little crazy. What led to that was one of our lead investigators – 
Um, they're actually uh, Caden and Alyssa Mask, and they're actually Southern from Southern Ascension. Caden, we were all talking about it after our two blindfold sessions. He's like, I want to do this because I, I feel like I'm ready. I need to. So we did the exact same thing to him. So we were walking, um, walking him down the hallway, and we we knew we knew where we were going, uh, but he didn't necessarily know where he was going. So we ran him all around the hospital, blindfolded in the dark, and we got him to the room. We got him like two doors before the room, and he kind of started freaking out on us a little bit. And this is a seasoned investigator, so I mean, I wouldn't think anything about it. Um, we got. We're basically two hours down. We got to the next door, and he was like, we're very close to the candy man's room. And we all looked at each other and was like, yep, you're right on it. And so we kept him blindfolded, went in the room, and the entity or spirit that was there literally pushed him out of the room physically. What? Like, because we were, um, his wife had the actual video camera. It was kind of like behind him, you know, and she was like, okay, you're in the room, but if you go left, right, left, right, okay, now you're in the center of the room. You know, that kind of a deal. Okay. And literally, I heard her not necessarily scream, but she kind of like gasped a little bit. And he was pushed from behind, sort of into her and out in the hallway. And as soon as that happened, we all kind of, I kind of snickered because he did too. And he was like, he flipping scratched me. And you look, we looked up on his neck under it from his ear to his shoulder like, on his right side, and there was just marks, claw marks. Whoa. It was like just three lines, just straight down. And, you know, it was like, okay, we've all been, you know, been scratched here. We've all been poked and prodded. This one was different. You know, it was like, I know this person. I know him very well. You know, it's not a, a client or anything like that that we we go we go out and deal with. Like this is someone I know personally. Mm-hmm. You know, it kind of changed a little bit. And that's that's kind of the way we should all be when we're on investigations. But you know, we have that block of that mindset that we got to take care of the problem. But when this happened, it was like, no, he didn't just get scratched. And we all, there was five of us, we went back into the room. It was literally like just this ball of energy because you had the five paranormal investigators in there with you know all the knowledge and stuff that we have and our spiritual energy at the same time. And it just starts going crazy, just the activity. We start hearing doors slam down the hallway a little bit. You know, we're still running a camera too, not a vision camera. Well, as soon as the door starts slamming, then the door stopped slamming and the battery died. So one of the ladies went downstairs, we're talking, you know, two flights of stairs, got a battery, came running back up, put it in. And when we finally got recording again, it was a legit vortex that opened up. Now, what what do you mean by that? A vortex, like a spirit vortex. Uh huh. Because when we were all in the room, you know, we were asking questions stuff like that on our digital recorder. And I was like, I know how many people are in, are in here right now that are human, that are alive, and I also know how many spirits are in here too. And you could hear the spirit box say seven. And I just said seven, like, 30 seconds before that. So there was two with, uh, there was five of us human, two in the room, and then five more outside, five more spirits outside. Okay, okay. So we kind of started shifting in the room a little bit. Well, then the seven spirits came in the room. Ooh, okay. And we're, we're, we're all, like, sitting there going, okay, this is insane. Well, when that happened, I could almost see, and, and a couple other people, because like, you could literally almost see this vortex outside of the room. Like with your with, with your eyes, like your physical with eyes? With our human eyes, yes. Okay. It was so crazy, because it was like a portal, you know, like a portal. So one of the girls had uh, dowsing rods, and they were going nuts, too. Every question we asked, it intelligent answer, every question, you know, Move the Dowson rods right for yes, left for no. And every question we did, it answered it. And then we started hearing doors slam, and then that's when we closed it. We, we closed the, uh, the uh, portal back up. While all this was going on, all of this activity and the energy and, and the vortex, was there, what was the feeling? Very unnerving, very edgy, because you have the five of us in that room in our energies. Then you have the spiritual energy. So it was almost like controlled chaos because we, we were basically just 
we were just watching what was going on around us because every machine that we had in there, we had like a little light up ball, you know, like for animals, cats and dogs. If you bounce it, it'll light up. Yeah. And those, all those were going off at the same time. We had three of those. Those were going off at the same time. The ghost box wouldn't, wouldn't stop. It just kept, kept going. Um, the thousand rods wouldn't stop. So it was just crazy energy. And that's the first time I felt that much in one place. I mean, just you describing it, it does sound like chaos. <laughs> yes, it, it, it was because that was that's the only way I, I would know actually how to, to describe it. And like I said, I just went there to be an observer, sort of, you know, I was like, because you, know, you pay to go and you're like, it's a haunted location and you just go and, and do it. OK, OK. And I'd already. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. Please, please. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying I, I, I'd been there a couple of times, so I sort of knew what to expect. But this time was just a little bit different because it was it was a little more intense. And if if don't quote me on this, but the people that own it are actually going to try to use it as a training facility. Oh, for for what? Uh, for for paranormal. For people getting into paranormal or just for paranormal enthusiasts. Oh. To to let them experience, like nobody that knows anything about paranormal, they're trying to get it set up where they can come there and learn about it and understand how it happens and what ha- what happens. Yeah. Well, from the sounds of it, it sounds like this would be, you know, uh, so long as it's respectfully done. So um, this would be a very good place to uh, put somebody who doesn't know much about it and, uh, you know, in the field, uh, since there's so yeah. much energy and it's consistently like this. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. The first couple hours when we were there, it was very, very nonchalant. Like it wasn't, nothing was really happening. And because we were joking around and having fun and, you know, getting everything set up. And then it was like, it almost felt like the mood changed a little bit, kind of. And we all felt that. And that's when everything started started changing. Right. And you said that all kind of culminated around like two something in the morning, like the, the witching hour. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Well, let's um there's a piece of evidence that I'd like to talk about. Can okay. can you talk about the photo? Yeah, I can. The way that was set up was in the photo to my right was like our lounge area or that's where the people like if you go there for an overnight that's where your coffee refrigerator all that stuff is um there's two doors and i was standing at the the farthest door towards the entrance of the main hospital and this is the second floor what it was the first floor is now but this is what used to be the, the main entrance this is where you like you would come in um this this area I was in was blocked off. This was all the, the nurses and doctors stations. There was a desk right there. And then through there, it was like another little nurse station and then the elevators. And then there was a glass window. So I'm probably, I, I don't, I guess 60 feet, 70 feet from this. I took a couple of pictures of me just standing there goofing around. And I took two pictures and I could see my reflection in the glass. And then I was like, well, let me step back in. So I stepped back in, took two more pictures, and come back out, and I took two more pictures, but from at like an angle. And that's what developed, or what, what I caught on my phone, was, was the picture that I sent you. And you can see my outline pretty good, but if you're looking at the picture to the left, it's pretty crazy looking. But then when you look at my picture again, you don't really necessarily see me there. It's it's really strange on the pictures. It's it's crazy. Yeah, it's it's an incredible photo. Um, at so, at what point did you actually notice the figure? It, it was only after you took that picture and and reviewed it. It it was a couple of days after. Yeah. Okay. Um, any ideas, or have you given any thought as to what or who that could have been? I honestly don't know. I've looked at it every which way. I mean, I've changed the colors on it, and I've done, you know, everything I do on my phone to look at it, and I have no idea. It kind of freaked me out a little bit, because when I looked at it, I was like, whoa, wait a second. I wasn't standing there Yeah. when I took this picture. Yeah. I was standing there in the first two pictures, 
and the other, you know, the other two, I had my hand out, like out facing the same direction and took pictures. And I was like, that's what I think freaked me out. Okay. Can you describe just for the listeners, what is it that you actually caught? What I got from me going back to review the picture was there was definitely to the left side of the picture, it was almost like a fog or a smoke. But you see my reflection, but I'm not standing there. I'm not standing in the picture. So I don't know what happened, how that happened. But you partially see my outline. And now we're and we're talking like you're going through four doorways to take that picture. Mm-hmm. So it's a distance back. And I think that's what freaked me out. Because when I first saw it, I was just flipping through real fast. I wasn't even really paying attention. And I thought, because it's all, it's all me. You know, it's all just random funny pictures with me in it. And then when I flipped back and I went, wait a second, that's not me because I only took two pictures with me in it. Okay. <laughs> you okay. know, my brain clicked. Yeah. That was, it was, it was sort of freaky when I, when I, that happened. Yeah. Is, is it up anywhere that folks can take a look for themselves? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I haven't posted it yet. Um, I'm always leery about posting my evidence. I post some stuff, but what I'll do is I will post it on my Instagram. And I will also post it uh, on my Facebook page and my Knoxville, the Knoxville Paranormal page. Very cool. Um, so those are three three places that if anybody wants to see it, they can check it out and tell me what they see. Because I always welcome other people's opinions uh, because they may see something completely different than I see or something I, that I didn't even catch. Right, right. Or have have different thoughts about, you know, what could be the cause of it or, yeah, yeah, just it's always good to get some other opinions because yes. when you're in it, you know, you're you're emotionally invested in it at that point, and sometimes we can't really see it uh, except from an outside point of view. Um, very cool. Yeah. So, uh, people listening, if that's interesting, you go check it out. Um, we'll 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 link all of that down below. Um, so, I I recently had um, Hannah Bird on with Spooky Bee Paranormal, and I asked her. Uh, what kind of location she could always count on to be haunted. And without hesitation, she said, hospitals. Now, I I know you guys also investigate, you you investigate a bunch of places. You you investigate a a well-known prison up in your area as well. It's pretty active. Would you say that um, the old Pittsburgh hospital is more haunted or active? I would say it's definitely like my top five places. Okay. That, that I, I will go back to again, definitely. It's it's hard to explain Old South Pittsburgh, like, briefly, but just like she was saying uh, in the last uh, interview, hospitals are, seem to be the number one hotspot okay. for, for paranormal stuff. Yeah, yeah, and I, I totally understand why. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of grieving and a lot of happiness and, you have a lot of sadness. I mean, all the emotions that we go through are combined. That's that's a that's a very very good location. Yeah, yeah. And where else? I mean, where else would you think of a location that does have all of this energetic emotional stuff going around? Um, all different types uh, flying around, but also be so like side by side with abrupt endings, abrupt endings and beginnings, you know, birth and death all in yeah. one. So I, I yeah. completely understand that. Well, what other, what, what's your other top five? Like what other places would you compare it to as far as amount of evidence or activity? I know, um, of course, Birchie Mountain was, was pretty good for me. It was very enlightening, but it was, it was very sad at the same time. For, for being a prison. And I've, I've heard stories from other, from other people, other investigators that have been to other prisons and it's, it's kind of the same, you know, they get that same feeling, but those, those are probably my top two. My third one is the Greenback Castle out in Greenback, Tennessee. That's somewhere that I will not go back again. I will not go back there. Oh, why? But that was, that was my first experience with someone that physically changed appearance. Oh, like a like a person you were with, and and they changed. Well, it was the the person that owned it or owns it is very eccentric, and there was like eight or nine of us there that night, and it was very very weird. He was acting very weird, and we were talking to him. I saw his eyes go from normal 
to cat to black. Ooh. If I hadn't physically saw that myself, you'll be like, yeah, you saw that in a movie. But that's the first time I saw actually someone's features change. That's, that's, I, Craig wants, wants me to go back. But I, I always joke with him and told him, I was like, no. I said, I'm not going back, um, you know, unless we have like some big TV production crew or something. I said, because I still wouldn't feel like safe then. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and he always laughs and you know goes on, but it's just a it's a really creepy place. Okay. Um, another another thing, and this reminded me because you were talking about the ladies who were blindfolded. I also talked mm-hmm. to um, Hannah, and then actually heard like right after, like the very next day, on another friend uh, of mine's show, uh, a guest talking about the Estes method which both of them ha- have used or use quite frequently. Um, has your group dabbled in this method at all? We have a little bit. We have done the Gonsfeld experiment. Wait, what's that? Um, that's basically where you sit someone in a chair, let what they volunteer, and you sit someone in a chair. You either blindfold them, and you put basically like two pair of blindfolds on them so they cannot see, you know, any light whatsoever, and you can use that or you can use ping pong balls. That's what the the theory is, the method is. You take ping pong balls or a blindfold, and if you have ping pong balls, you tape them, like kind of over your eyes, uh, so it does allow light to come in. Um, So you you sit down, and then you have strobe lights going or a TV that's all like on the black and white channel, or what is it called? When it goes, it used to go off air. Like oh, the noise, yeah, the white yeah. noise. Mm-hmm. You have that going, or yeah, that's another option. But you sit there and you have headphones on, and I think I, I cannot think what we used the last time. Um, but you have headphones on with like kind of white noise too. So you're basically completely blindfolded, sitting there, and people people that are outside of you or sitting around you ask questions. And you hear the spirits come through the, the radio to your headphones and you answer their questions or you say what you hear them say. Okay. Okay. So it's a, it's a little variation on the yes. Estes method. Okay. Yes. What, what was this method called? Uh, the Gonsfeld. Gonsfeld. Gonsfeld experiment. Okay. 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 Man, I've never heard of it. You learn something new every day. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you, like, as far as those types of methods, what do you think about their validity? I personally think they're pretty legit, honestly, because if you you can't can't see and you can hear, but the only thing you can hear is static or white noise in your headphones. I think you're honestly going to hear something or you're not. Mm-hmm. And there have been some some people that have just not heard anything at all. Right. And we do like 10-minute sessions, and they haven't heard any anything. No questions being asked, no responses from the I know. I mean, nothing. So, but then I've had some people that, that I've done it with very, very, like you can ask questions and say, now, mind it, they can't hear you. <laughs> so... You can you just ask questions like, do you know what year this is? Do you you know just simple questions, and it might not be right then, but the person sitting there will blurt out the year, or the time, or something relevant to the spirit that they're talking to. Yeah, it's um, it's very compelling evidence. <laughs> it really is. It, it is because when they answer, it, when you ask a question, they answer, and you're, you look at the person next to you going, "Did that seriously just happen?" Oh yeah, <laughs> just stand the hair straight up on your arms and your eyebrows yep. too. Just stand straight up. Exactly. <laughs> Are you into the paranormal, true ghost stories, Bigfoot and alien encounters, or high strangeness and conspiracies? Well, if so, then you should check out my podcast called Somewhere in Dreamland. My name is Ken Mark, and every week I interview authors, researchers, and experiencers alike in the fields of the paranormal, cryptozoology, ufology, and spirituality. So why not take a dive down that rabbit hole with me and search for Somewhere in Dreamland wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Somewhere in Dreamland. You've been involved with 
over a hundred paranormal cases by this point. Yes. You guys have been at this for years. I bet yes. you've got some stories to share. We can do that this time. What are some of your most memorable investigations or findings? Uh, we've been on so many, um, so many cases. Um, the one that still, and this is, I, I'm not sure if I've talked about it with you or not, but strangely enough, before we went um, to Old South Pittsburgh, myself, Tamana, Craig, and his niece, we had this local pizza pizza place. And I was like, hey, he called me up. He said, hey, you want to go get lunch? I said, yeah, man. I said, just meet me over here. And he's like, not a problem. So now I went to this place a couple of times before this. Over there, and it's like a pizza, and then you have ice cream right beside it. And the ice the ice cream shop is actually in a house that was built. It's like 180 years old. So, you know, I'm not thinking nothing about it. the first couple of times that I went. I didn't think nothing about it. Didn't even, you know, didn't cross my mind. So I meet Craig over there. We get out. We go and eat pizza. And you walk right across the little street, and you go into the house, and they have like homemade ice cream and stuff. So we order, and Craig's going, this house sure looks different. It looks, it looks very different now than it used to. And I'm, I'm standing there, like, trying to decide what kind of ice cream I want. And I was like, Craig, what are you talking about? Because he was, like, talking loud, you know, louder than normal. And so we, we place our order. We go sit down, and he was like, I'm not really feeling too hot. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, you look fine. By that time, the ice cream came. We sat there, enjoyed our ice cream. The left, the the most craziest part was he texted me when he got home, and he was like, you know that house is the house we investigated. And I was like, no, it wasn't. I said it was a different house. Well, seven years prior, the lady that owned that house was, was having paranormal issues, and there was nothing around that house at that time. It was just a house. Well, well, now everything's built up, so there's like a little strip mall and, you know, stuff like that. I never paid any really attention to it because it had been seven years ago, right? So I didn't really think nothing about it. Yeah. And when Craig texted me, I was like, no. So I started looking through some of my files, and I was like, holy crap, it was. That was the same house. And I messaged Craig back, and I was like, you were right. It was the same house. He was like, dude. And this was like, I messaged him back that. And he messaged me back. He said, I'm still not feeling good. And like two days after that, he texted me, texted me back and he was like, that house? He's like, no, I, I don't think I can go back. He goes, it, it, he goes, it's like it physically made me sick. And I was like, are you serious? And he was like, yeah. He goes, I, he goes, it literally, he said something about that house. He said, I couldn't quit, like quit thinking about it. Had it made him, like, sick or ill when you had been there the, the seven years prior? No, we, it was fine. Yeah, we were, like, we were there, like, seven years prior. Oh. And and it was no, it was fine, no big deal. And then, and then since then, of course, this changed hands. Because um, when we were, we went to the original investigation um, for the lady that lived there, and she was an international uh, art dealer, and she would go to... Italy, France, Russia, Spain, wherever, and buy for antique furniture sets and have them shipped back to sell. So that hurt. So her whole house was nothing but antique furniture from other countries, and that was the reason. One reason we had went out there in the first place because she was having problems, was having issues and stuff. And when we left, we you know tried to explain to her very nicely that hey, all this stuff is the reason while you're having the problems you're having. So not only do you have all these spirits in your house, but you have all these spirits in your house that are from different cultures. So now, <laughs> so now, and so now, you know, and she's looking at me like, I don't understand what you're saying. She goes, this is my job. And we were trying to explain to her that, hey, you might want to try to either limit purchasing stuff or, you know, doing something a little different because she was bringing all this negativity into her house or where's negativity or positivity. But, a lot of it was negativity. And did she ever, as far as you know, pick up what you were putting down? She, after we talked to her, she contacted a cleansing or spiritual advisor. Uh, his name is uh, Bill Bean. 
I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. Never dealt with him or anything before this, and never really have since. She got in contact with him, um, which we referred her. We contacted him, and then she got in contact. And he came out and basically spent the night. We had all of our cameras still set up and got rid of whatever bad stuff was there, supposedly. But then fast forward and, and uh, fast Craig's forward. getting sick. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I haven't spoke to the owners uh, that actually own these two businesses. It's the same people. But I'm really curious to find out if any anybody that works there or or if they've ever had any issues, which it's kind of hard to do. Like, hey, you know, my name is Jason Fife. I'm a fossil paranormal detective. Um, we were here seven years ago. Uh, this place is haunted. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know what? <laughs> yeah, it's so kind of people you know, might like, not take too kindly to uh, no, <laughs> to that. no, and that's and I, I joke about that all the time. You know, and they're just looking at me like, what? And I'm like, that's kind of how you have to do it. You know, <laughs> no other, no other way. <laughs> oh. But but you kind of have to step step softly when you start talking to people about this stuff, especially business owners and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? And and that's understandable too. I'm, I'm sure that that lady, you know, as much as she wanted to uh, be done with the, the stuff that was happening, like, you know, it, it's, it is her business, you know, that's how she makes yeah. her living. And I, I yeah. get the, yeah. uh, the reticence to, um, to change. Yes. And it's interesting that that stuff was still happening, even though she was not really understanding what you were trying to say, you know, with the objects yeah. themselves having these energies or attachments. Yes. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It was just, it, it's, it's interesting when people still experience this stuff and they, you know, aren't even aware of what could possibly no. be causing it. No, it's, it's very, I think, and, a lot of times, and I, I don't do this often as I should, but everything we buy, anything we bring into our home, whether it's brand new, used, or whatever, you know, people have touched it. And I don't want to freak anybody out. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it, and, and that's, a, that's a thing I haven't really thought about until recently. You know, the, the, the FedEx guy that brings your package, drops it off, and, okay, well, you've got to think how many people before him have touch your merchandise right Uh, they leave a little imprint on that so and not saying it happens but what happens if that's that's where that spirit goes that's the last product they made or last thing they touched or you know the last dresser they looked at or whatever you know that was in their home then you get it is it something attached to it or not yeah yeah and and sometimes you don't know until mm-hmm. it's it's been in your home for a while, yep. and uh, you're like, oh, well, I don't know why the lights are always <laughs> flickering now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so strange, you know? but I got this new sofa. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, because I picked up a yard sale for 15 bucks, <laughs> and, you know, it's great, but then there's no warning labels or anything on it yeah. so oh, like whatever that, like happens that, that... <laughs> the meme have you seen the meme with the trunk that's sitting on the side of the road and it's got the sign on it not haunted free to take <laughs> yeah, <I hope. laughs> everything needs a sign is it haunted or not yep that's a big thing here actually in louisiana it's so funny i've never seen it anywhere else where if a place is up for sale they will actually have real signs on the buildings underneath the sale notice, not haunted. That's hilarious. It's, is that not hysterical? That's, oh my God. It, I'm sure they do it elsewhere, you know, especially in the New England area and all that, that is definitely uh, haunted and has that kind of activity. But I thought that was so funny. Um, it, it is. Well, we we uh, also talked last time we spoke about your empathic bordering on mediumistic abilities. Um, I know you won't quite go there, uh, but I I was curious if you got, if lost souls do utilize specifically the help of people with those kinds of abilities like that, like that's their calling card. Like, do you often bring on mediums or psychics to kind of help with the investigations? Yes, we do. 
Um, and a lot of time that's either at our discretion or the client's discretion. Um, if a client requests that, then we'll do our best to make it happen. Uh, or, if, or if we feel that they need to come in and take a look at it, then we'll, we'll try to bring somebody in. I got you. Okay, but, if, so- but if the client doesn't want it, then we won't, we won't do it. Are they considered part of your like core group, or are, are they? You just have people that you can call on when you need them. We have people that we we can call on and and just and ask them. And, just, and usually, sometimes it's we get to get out two three people. You know, before like we might call two people and they're busy and say, "Hey, you're not busy on a Wednesday night at eleven thirty, are you?" And, you know, or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> because this, this doesn't sleep. So, you know, it's a. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all keep uh, very odd hours. <laughs> very odd, yes. <laughs> well, do you guys ever specifically recruit for new people to join you, you know, like join your group? Honestly, it's been Craig and I since the start. Right. That's We haven't looked for anybody um, to do it. Normally, we just Im- we invite people. Um, if, if, we're at, if we know we're going on an investigation, if it's a client, then like the old South Pittsburgh thing, we, we invited to kill some people, which was my friend Brandon that I work with. But if it's a client, then we will normally, it's just me and Craig. Yeah, okay. I was just curious. I've been talking to a, a few more people since I, I spoke to you last, and everybody does it, you know, kind of differently. Um, all right. Well... I've just looked at the clock. We we have run out of time again. This went by so oh, no. fast. But uh, <laughs> before I let you go, hey, I've got yes. I've got a, a brand new round of uh, speed round questions for you. <laughs> okay. You remember these? Yes. I hope we don't bomb this too bad. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> you did great last time. You did great. All right. I'll kick it off with a real random one, something we've never talked about. What's your favorite cryptid and why? I would have to say Bigfoot, if he's still in the cryptic category. Um, I live, of course, close to the Smoky Mountains. So growing up, I've always heard of Bigfoot. That, that's a big one. You know, that's the, that's the thing I've always heard about. And that's the one I researched the most. So I'd have to say Bigfoot. Okay. All right. What is the dream location you would love to investigate someday? If I had the opportunity, Bobby Mackey's in Kentucky is number one on my list. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same, brother. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one that if... If it goes like I think it would probably go, then it may be semi-retired after that. You know, <laughs> that sort of deal. Yeah. I've never <laughs> seen an investigation or a video taken there of, of the paranormal activity that didn't just downright terrify me. That place is yes. something else. Yep. All right. From all of your investigative and personal experiences, what is something that a lot of folks believe about the supernatural maybe it's in the mainstream or generally accepted that you think we've gotten wrong that's a that's a tough one i hope this i I answer this correctly but not all ghosts are ghosts not all spirits are spirits okay what what have you discovered that leads you to believe that a lot of investigations you'll get dust or shadows or this or that of stuff and it's not real right. and a lot of people believe that i've captured i've captured it you know i'm that one person i've got the ultimate capture and only a handful of times in my life have i actually got really great evidence okay all right let's squeeze one last question in here oh uh, what is the one singular ultimate reason that the paranormal, the mysterious, the supernatural is undeniably real for you? That's a tough one, too. Um, With me growing up the way I did, it just validated that there's so much more out there than us, that it's, it's almost incredible to me for people to think that we're alone or that we have, you know, we're on Earth and this is it. It's there's so much more 
out there, extraterrestrials, cryptids, all kinds of stuff. And for for me, that's always kind of been a drive. That's I've I've never really known anything else. And it's it's kind of a it's kind of just a knowing, isn't it? Yes, very yeah. very much so. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> this has been so much fun. Again, I, I yes. loved being able to have you back on, brother. Uh, before we sure. wrap. What have yes. you guys got coming up next? Anything exciting on the docket? Nothing as of yet. We're possibly looking at going to Scarefest in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, possibly going up there. It's in October. Ooh, so Scarefest. Yes. It's one of the leading, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's one of the leading horror and comic cons for the past 15, 14, 15 years. Okay. No, I, I hadn't heard of that one. I, I got to check it out. It's a lot of uh, 80s. They do a lot of 80s and 90s horror. Like this year, Robert England's going to be there. What? Um, it's, yeah, it's, there's going to be a bunch of people that are coming to this one. So they're trying to make up, I guess, for the COVID thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get, <laughs> get it all in now. Um, are you guys just going as, as just attendees? Do you, are you setting up a booth? Anything yeah. like that? No, we're, we're just going. Just go, going just to go, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, that if sounds. Don't get sold out. That sounds awesome. I I notice, yeah, because I've been keeping my eye on on a on a few uh, paracons and and pod fests and everything. Maybe it is that post COVID excitement. Every, everything's getting sold out, so I got to get my butt in gear and and actually purchase some tickets here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, how about you remind my listeners where they can find and follow you and Lost Souls Paranormal Detectives? Okay. You can follow uh, myself. I'm on Instagram, um, Jason575. Uh, you'll see my picture on there. And I'm also um, on Facebook under Jason5. And also we have on Facebook the Knoxville Paranormal Society. So either one of those three platforms that you, you can follow me on and just shoot me a message you know, when, you, when you send me a friend request or whatever. Just send me a message. Say, hey, I heard you on the podcast. That would be great. Awesome. All right. Well, before we wrap the episode, Jason, yes. do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom you would like to leave with everyone? <sighs> the only words of wisdom I have for right now is go out and do your thing no matter what it is it doesn't have to be paranormal you know, go out live your best life go out and enjoy everything you can enjoy because life is short so if you have any doubts about doing stuff just do it like nike just just do it because you'll, you'll regret it thank you jason You're welcome. it has been a pleasure sir yes ma'am same here Thanks again to Jason Fife for coming back on, and thanks to Lost Souls Paranormal Detectives. If you didn't tune in last week, you might have missed the announcement about the Tarot of the Unexplained Kickstarter that just launched a week ago by my friend Dave at DaveZilla.art on Instagram. This project kicks butt. You don't believe me? Just take a look for yourself at the link below. This deck is so unique and beautiful and chock full of all original artwork portraying many of the oddities of the paranormal world that any enthusiast of the strange and unusual can get behind. I know he'd be thrilled to have your support. If you just aren't in a place financially to pledge, share it on your socials with folks you know would love something like this. Follow the show at Paranorm Girl Pod on all social platforms. Check out the website if you haven't been in a while. Been uh, incrementally adding more content, including some of the past interviews I've been lucky enough to have on a few other podcasts and radio shows. So they'll all be right there in one spot for your convenience. ParanormGirlPod.com, folks. Please join me next week for my talk with paranormal investigator at Paranormal Quest and operator of the Archive of the Afterlife Museum that contains many haunted and possessed objects, Steve Hummel. Ladies and gents, I am beside myself to get to speak with him. Don't miss it. All right, that's a wrap for today. Stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.